You are listening to the Icehouse Podcast, hosting conversations with gritty Kiwi business owners and leaders and industry leading minds. Hi everyone, it's Briya. Welcome to the Ice House podcast. I am the community manager here and I have a great privilege of sharing our alumni stories on our weekly podcast. This is another brilliant story. I loved going along to Blue Lab, which is a company based in Tauranga. They are really leading the way when it comes to measurement tools, manufacturing and exporting uh, in the growing and agri uh, sector. Their purpose is the art of growing growing for a healthier world. Um, They definitely are an incredible agriculture solution uh, when it comes to measuring and measurement tools. I had a little tour of uh, Blue Lab and was blown away by their processes um, and their commitment to quality. Uh, Mandy and Greg are incredible Ice House alumni. They did um, a 321 Go Global program potentially nearly 20 years ago um, at the Ice House and has stayed such a core part of the community in Tauranga. Uh, and they have recently just uh, successfully done a succession plan and an exit plan and now they have a new leadership team in place who I got to interview. Jono Jones is the new uh, CEO of Blue Lab and I also interviewed Ash Nicholson who is the new chief operations officer, so COO of Blue Lab. They were so awesome. They absolutely dropped gold. They talked about how they work together as a team and also work with uh, the international C-suite. They talked about how they keep resilience and wellness as a focus, um, how they really focus on company culture, um, what gets them out of bed in the morning and what a day in the life of them as leaders look like and a lot, lot more, including what they got from our leadership development program. Anyway, let's get into it. The conversation with Jono and Ash from Blue Lab. Thanks for listening. Very cool to be here. Uh, I like to start with a real general open question. Um, Jono, I'll start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourselves and your, about yourself and, and what your passion is. What you're passionate about. Yeah, okay. I'm really passionate about um, taking um, New Zealand product and businesses to the world, mm. so export businesses, and then that intersection between like technology and sustainability um, mm-hmm. and design, I think is actually a really interesting kind of place to, to play where you take into account, yeah, like the promise of technology, like the, what you can do for customers to yeah. kind of meet their unmet need. Um, and then also just achieving kind of solutions which are gonna be kind of better for the world going forward. So that, that's my passion yeah. in business, yeah. That's cool. and. Leading to that, what got you to that point? What what sparked that passion or what got you to your role as CEO at Blue Lab today? Yeah, okay. So I trained in the UK in design, so product design, um, mm. way back in the kind of like early 2000s. Um, and then went straight into med tech after then. So in startup, working in product design for particularly neonatal products, so pr- products for premature babies. So how oh, do you wow. move babies between hospitals? Um, and protect them from noise and thermal challenges and and vibrations. So there's a lot of like incubators and noise defense systems, really meaningful work. And that was where I really kind of cut my teeth in this idea of empathy, where you're mm. developing a product for somebody who you're not the customer. Yeah. I went from there down to London into energy management, product design, so developing solutions to help consumers understand their energy in their home. Mm-hmm. Um, that's all around behaviour change. And then left to travel, um, went for 18 months around the world. And during that 18 months, arrived in New Zealand, which awesome. should have been for three months, but then mm-hmm. that was kind of 13 years ago now. <laughs> <laughs> You're left. really here to stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it just absolutely <laughs> fell for it. And I was in, in the mountain in Taronga. Cool. Just got really kind of enamoured by the idea that you can have um, really kind of small, multifunctional kind of teams doing brilliant work and taking that to the world. Because okay. if you want to succeed in New Zealand, then you've got to be an export business. Mm. That's kind of something I believe in. Yeah, wow. Well. Um, yeah, and then it was during that time working with customers and clients, developing ideas through innovation. And they all had a twist around cons- uh, kind of consumer-centric, so user-centric ideas mm. underpinned with sustainable design principles. Yeah. And yep. um, then met Greg, a previous CEO of yep. Blue Lab, seven mm. years ago now, and 
I was talking to him about really kind of like what's that that again the promise of taking technology into agriculture, mm. putting it through a digital kind of transformation, and again in this world of sustainable agricultural practice, hydroponics mostly, kind of greenhouse production, and that's when I came on board um, in a product development role, and then since kind of laddered up over seven years into the wow. the CEO role now. Very, yeah. very cool. Mm. Yeah, Greg's been a massive part of the Ice House mm. as well, so cool to see, um, yeah, how that's all came about, even with his you know, success, succession planning um, and exit from the business last year. It's been quite a cool journey to watch. Um, so nice to sort of hear a little bit more about you guys as well, um, those that are taking the reins. Um, so on that note, Ash, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What are you passionate about and what led to the role of COO at Blue Lab? Yeah, what am I passionate about? Um, I mean, like personally, yep. um, <laughs> I've got a couple of little kids and my wonderful wife, Jo, we live down here at the beach. So in terms of a passion of what I like to do outside of work, it's definitely seeing those two kids grow up on the beach and awesome. sort of have fun and play around in the surf and get out and catch the waves myself every now and again. So cool. that's definitely the sort of the passion and drive of living down here and, and being part of the bay mm. um, and sort of the motivating factor at home more than anything else to keep supporting them and doing fun stuff and being as fun of a dad as I can as I've got a <laughs> fairly stressful personality and a stressful <laughs> job and with twins it's not that easy being, <laughs> no. uh, being that calm. But no, yeah. it's, uh, so that sort of is the home stuff. But in terms of, in terms of like career and work, um, I've always enjoyed – talking to people like I'm an extrovert and I like you know interacting and leading and sort of being that relationship between you know sort of employee employer mm, um, cool. and I've always been uh, someone who likes getting stuff done like yeah. a maker of stuff like a deliverer of things awesome. so I've always been involved in businesses and in roles in which have been on the operational delivery kind of side yeah. um, and I kind of I like jumping into big challenges and problems so my sort of career journey has always been, it's been across a number of different kind of industries and companies and structures, um, but it's always been in a role where I'm just trying to learn as much of a skill set as I can mm. in the delivery side of a business to help move a business forward, really. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's what I like doing. <clears throat> so yeah, awesome. um, and that's kind of led me into the role at COO here, as I really see it as assisting deliver the business's objectives and contribute strategically and I get to meet a lot of people and have a lot of those relationships with direct reports and staff mm -hmm. and really just trying to contribute as, as much as we can to grow the business and, mm -hmm. and be a really fun place to work at the same time. Yeah, so cool. Yeah, it sounds like you've got that good balance of operational and very people-based, um, you know, that sort yeah. of side of things. And, like, I think cool. you have to be, right? Yeah, like, for sure. You can't do the work of 100 people, so you've got to make sure that you can lead them the right way to get the body of work done and face the challenges that are sitting there. So, yeah, yeah, for sure, yeah. Awesome. Cool. Amazing context to you guys and, and your roles. Um, question for both of you, but maybe you could start, Jono. What, what's been a really important lesson that you've learnt over your career? Maybe... If you were to give your past self some advice or, you know, some learnings from your career so far. I'd probably go to the people part of it. Yeah. And just actually like how, for me, like business at the end of the day is just a group of people who come together who are like driven by different, probably kind of like different kind of purposes, if mm -hmm. you like. Mm -hmm. um, and you've just got to get them rallied to do the best work of their life. And I think that that's like a lesson I've kind of learned over time where I think when you start your career, you're kind of one of those cogs. And as you kind of advance up the ladder, you realize you're trying to kind of move all those cogs at the same time. Yeah. And you've got to motivate them and you then got to inspire them and reward them and recognize them mm -hmm. in ways which are quite personalized. I think like increasingly we're kind of like moving to like quite kind of like personalized kind of approaches with, with that kind of aspect with people. But yeah, it's just like business is just a group of people who have to turn up and do brilliant work. Yeah, and that's so cool. I've definitely kind of learned learned that. Um, yeah, kind of like on that leadership journey from being just you're kind of one of the people to yeah, kind of moving the engine. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. I love that. The best work of your life. Mm. That's really inspiring. That's cool. What about you, Ash? For that same question. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that Jono makes. But mm. I mean, 
for myself, I think the the biggest piece of advice for myself would probably be like, just don't be so hard on yourself. Mm. Like, you know, when yeah. you're learning and you're trying to like do the best and just like John, I say, trying to do the best work of your life, like yeah. you're allowed to make mistakes along the way and like not know what you're doing. And like, I think the biggest lesson I've realized over working is that no one really is a hundred percent like confident in what they're doing all the time. Yeah. Even if it's like the CEO or an operations manager or the guy working on the floor or the mm. production assembler or whatever, like everyone's learning at the same time and just trying to figure it out. And, totally. You know, that like fake it till you make it's a true thing and yeah. eventually you become competent. But that's probably the biggest learning that I've like reflected on mm. is that you don't actually need to know everything on day one. Yeah. You like learn that through the process and you've you've got to be aspirational but you can't be so hard on yourself that you it's detrimental to your confidence or to your ability to like put your hand up and say yes to things because yeah. you're just supposed to learn along the way and, and you'll eventually grow a skill set that helps you in the end. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Yeah, and especially if you're part of a company like Blue Lab that is, you know, leading edge in certain areas, there will always be times where someone in the business is like, okay, this is so new for us, you know, like we're not sure what yeah, the way forward is, let's work it out together. And, yeah. yeah, so that's really cool. I like that. That's both brilliant pieces of advice really. Um, why Blue Lab for you both? What excites you most about the the future of the company as well? Maybe, John, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, well, I think if you look like the macro trends around Blue Lab, it's in a really, really exciting space. Mm. And we can see, you know, the, the impact that, agriculture has kind of on the world from an environmental perspective is just so significant and we're sitting like right here we're sitting at a time where like food security is a really pressing issue around the mm. world like fertilizer costs just rocketing because of like ukraine war but then you've got areas like singapore you know kind of driving to be much more kind of sustainable around their food security challenges same as the middle east as yeah. we switch from the oil economy to you know kind of um you know kind of alternative ways for those those territories to kind of like drive their kind of future so um and then there's like water right there's this kind of issue of water um insane flooding over the weekend mm. in auckland yeah in one world and then you've got in incredible kind of droughts in other worlds and i think it i think we're what Blue Lab does and our kind of technology is enabling crops to be grown in really kind of challenged environments with much lower kind of lower resources. Mm. And that's a really important space for it to be. And I think one kind of connecting to the climate change thing, which is just has just gathered pace so significantly, like during the, the last kind of three years through COVID, I think it's just a lot more people just became much more attuned to like their position in the planet. It's, I think a lot of people kind of underappreciate how that rising temperature we talk about one degree or one and a half degree but for every degree i think it's in like 20 percent more moisture kind of mm. gets added to the atmosphere so we're going to get these like catastrophic mm. um, weather events so i'm really inspired and passionate about the role that controlled environment agriculture can have on the mm. world and we can help you know kind of accelerate those world's food baskets in areas which can support um controlled environment and meet the needs of a growing population Mm. Um, awesome. And it starts with like simple, dependable technology, and I think we're in a we're in a really, really good position to be kind of supporting that future. Mm, that's great. It comes back to that passion of yours, right? Of mm. um, climate change, sustainability, and mm. technology coming together. Mm, yeah. It's really cool. What about you, Ash? Yeah, I think like John I said, like the Blue Lab's got a really like solid foundation and purpose to it. So it's yeah. like my family background is from agriculture and horticulture and you know, I like went to university and, and studied that and that's mm -hmm. kind of where my family's sort of base is. Um, yeah. So there's a nice like primary industry tie for me. Um, yeah. And, you know, like I mentioned at the start, you know, spending time in the ocean and being outside all the time, like you kind of want to make sure that that's there for mm -hmm. future generations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but in terms of why it attracted me, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really good size business with really good challenges um that is based down in in Tauranga. so yep. like you know it's a it's a bit of a unicorn in that respect yeah, um, it is. yeah and you know the people are really good you know it's it's got a pretty nice feeling it's got a pretty mm -hmm. flat hierarchy kind of structure um and it's a it's a business that i think has got lots of um potential to continue to grow given its export market space 
that really solid foundation of a purpose, but also being in a tech kind of industry. Mm. I think there's scalability there. Um, so the challenges are big enough, the people are nice, and it's got a really good purpose. Mm. Yeah, awesome. Man, you guys are so articulate. It's great. <laughs> These answers are just incredible. Um, I want to get a bit of a feel for your guys' working relationship. So how does that work? Um, what does a day in the life look like really of, of both of you? Can I ask that? Ash, you can. Yeah. Um, Good question. <laughs> my, day, my days start really early. Yeah. Um, so like a... With having twins, you don't get a lot of sleep. How old us. How old are the twins? So they're two and a half. Okay, now. yeah, so yeah. So, like, yeah. it's been, I started with Blue Lab three years ago. So, it's been a pretty, like, busy three years. By Absolutely. the time we have COVID, moved down here, twins, start mm. a new job, succession plan through that, and then figure it out. You know, yeah. so, like, it's pretty Massive. busy. Yeah. Um, but that's good. Yeah. Uh, so, like, a day in the life, I get up really early. My exercise usually starts at about 4.30, oh. home at 6 to deal with the kids and then here as early as possible. Cool. Um, and I, I like talking to the people, talking to people. Yep. so I'll walk the floor every morning. Mm -hmm. um, the manufacturing guys are here at 7, so I'll go and talk to most people and try and talk to everyone every day. That's one of my like leadership goals out of the Ice, Ice House course was Great. just be personable. Yep. Um, and then we sort of get into the daily meeting stuff and, mm. and Jono and I will check in across a week once formally and mm. but we're pretty open and can just tap each other on the shoulder and say, hey, I just need your opinion or this is happening and something's yeah. going on. But, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's a pretty full-on kind of day. Um, but I'm, I'm very kind of clear on at the end of the day, I also need to go home and see the kids mm. at the same time. So, yeah. you know. You work really hard to get the benefit of being able to disappear out of the office at sort of 3.30 to 4 o'clock yeah. so you can spend a couple of hours with the kids and actually see them, even mm. though they're really grumpy at that time of day, <laughs> <laughs> um, and sort of totally. do that home stuff at the same time. Yeah. So, But in terms of so important. working here, like obviously started while Jono was a couple of years in mm. um, and we had different roles over the last few years, but it's been good uh, and it's been a nice journey sort of both of us working through the company and understanding what our like roles and purposes are and what skill set we actually bring to each other's roles to complement them. Yes. And I think that's a really key part when you're trying to build like a C suite in that senior leadership team is that you've really got to build that team and understand what your strengths are and what mm -hmm. is your role and how do you deliver it. And also there's a responsibility to be pretty autonomous in that and actually be in control of the things that you're supposed to be in control of and yep. ask for the support when you need it. But don't overreach and extend that because you've you're supposed to, you've got some accountability to deliver when you get into those more senior roles. Totally. So, yeah, yeah I think it's, um, but underpinning that, you've got to have a good, like, personal relationship at the same time. You've mm. got to understand each other as people. You've got to, like, have a genuine interest in each other's lives and families. And mm. there's a respect that comes alongside with the support. So, mm. yeah. yeah, that's awesome. Okay, I'm going to come back to a question there, but first I want I want Jono's context if, that, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah no, some good points there. So, mm. well, yeah, what does our week look like? So, um, so Ash, so as a senior leadership team, we meet we meet twice a week now. So we book in the week where we go Tuesday mornings, Friday mornings. We do, the reason we do Tuesday is we've got a chief revenue officer up in Chicago. Oh, wow, so yeah. her week starts on our kind of Tuesday. So we kind of, we, and we've tried, we've experimented with a few kind of ideas here. We've gone through like daily stand-ups mm. through to now um, Tuesdays, Fridays. Great. And that's that's like you set up the week and then you kind of try and close the week and do a handoff because um, Darcy's got an extra day kind of up in the US. Of course, on yeah. On Saturday. So that's where we're kind of like formally kind of like looking at project workflow, critical kind of goals that week. But like Ash said, then we, we do kind of one-on-ones. Um, through the week as well, when we're focusing much more kind of on the like the uh, kind of the, the team, the individual kind of mm. progress against kind of goals and aspirations. Um, but then I think like you know I think Ash was making some good points there around how like he's kind of like build, building his kind of like work life around his kind of like home life. Mm. And like I do the same. Like I've got three kids, but they're just late starters, right? Mm. You know, Ash is up at half four, but mine's <laughs> scratching out in bed at half past seven. So. <laughs> so I'm in at kind of 8.30 and then I'll work a little bit later and then leave home, get the kids to bed. Sometimes you kind of open the laptop kind of later into the evening, but yeah. you just kind of make it work these days. Mm. Yeah. And I think because we're so enabled on on chat and text mm. that you can, 
you can just very kind of quickly respond to anyone at any kind of point. Um, and yeah, mm. it's like we work in open plan office. So yeah, everyone's okay. there. And, you know, like that senior leadership, like built in, building that leadership team kind of idea is, you know, you, you have roles and kind of job descriptions, which sing, things kind of clearly fall into different teams kind of buckets. But that the harder thing is when, often like the hardest problems sit at the intersection of kind of like more than one team. Yes. And it actually requires kind of one person to kind of grab it by the neck. Yeah, lead it. And just lead it mm. and just kind of pick it up and own it. And both Ash and I have kind of subscribed to like that extreme ownership kind of model with, with you know, Jocko's book, mm, um, which is a great read. Um, and, it do, you know, you, re- you need people in the business who are willing to pick up these problems, drive it, own it. And yeah, and just like not kind of worry about too much about getting it kind of perfect mm. often just like just doing something on it and acting on it is the yeah. most important thing so that's kind of how we engineer it I think is kind of yeah. like how we work together is you know there's a lot of autonomy in yep. the team um leveraging each other's skills mm. and, and then also like giving each other the opportunity to actually go and just try stuff but yeah very cool a line around the biggest problems that's the thing that's what we kind of like we constantly kind of like challenge ourselves with yeah, awesome. Yeah, picking up on something you've both said around, um, you know, knowing the people's strengths and weaknesses. Has there been any learnings on that journey or any specific things that you guys have done to work out what each other's strengths and weaknesses are, whether it's been testing or team days or a big flop that you're like, okay, actually that that person wasn't the right person to own that? Anything along those lines? Well, bringing it back to the, um, the LDP, yep. one thing that I took away from that was the, the TMI profile. Yes. TMS. Yes. T- T- TMI, yeah, TMI, TMI profiles. profiles. Yeah. yeah. Management, right? Yeah. 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 And we both like we both went through that <coughs> process when we were going through LDP. Yeah. I learned a lot about myself, but then we use that as a tool now at Blue Lab to understand each other. Brilliant. As well. Cool. So where do we kind of sit on those wheels? And for me that was quite a breakthrough where to build a high performing team you need um you need X kind of excellence like in all the way around that wheel mm-hmm. right from your kind of reporter advisor your creator innovator developers producers etc and knowing that not one person can do all of that yeah. leads you to a team approach so i've learned a lot about ash for example and the rest of the team by kind of understanding those profiles and working through them as a team yeah. where we get in a room and you know we kind of understand our ways of working and work preferences mm. that's been helpful yeah that's really cool yeah, I think that's important to take the time to do that with the wider team. And we're seeing more and more alumni from our leadership development program really like take that into their workplaces um, because you do learn a lot about yourself um, and a lot about the other people you're working with. So it's very cool. Yeah, it's 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 strikingly accurate. Mm. <laughs> yeah, like you read your own one you're yeah. like, did I write oh this? Yeah, you're like, oh my gosh, have they been watching me for a yeah. year? Like, this is creepy. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I've done it too. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is yeah. kind of insane. But yeah, I mean, it's also quite good when you take that back to your team. And even in the leadership development program, when you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I'm kind of this person, you almost have like this camaraderie connection thing because you understand each other's like drivers. So yeah. like, I think. Yeah, you know, I think it's done on like the first couple of days and that in the ice house course, mm-hmm. and it's like a nice way to understand. Well, okay, this is your job, and this is your name, and this is your role, but this is also how you think and how you like to work, and you can kind of figure out how you can like build a skill set in a team, yeah. like in the course, but also take that back and think about your own jobs and your own teams and your own lives, and mm-hmm. it's actually quite useful. Like it's really useful. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because it's that moment of going, oh, like everyone doesn't think the same as mm. me. It's like I've got to remind myself of that yeah. sometimes, you know. It's yeah. a really cool reminder for that, for sure. No, that's cool. Um, I do really want to take a moment to talk about what the transitions look like here. Um, so Greg's obviously been a big part of the Ice House, like I mentioned before. Um, last year, seeing that succession plan come into play, the exit plan for him, um, but knowing that that, transition has looked more than just a handover meeting <laughs> it's been it's been months in the making um could we talk about um how that transition has looked over the last six months yeah like i think you know it's, it's probably kind of years I mean, that, yeah, that's yeah. The other it's definitely longer well. than six months cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah like greg you know greg and i first started kind of talking about the kind of prospect like kind of years ago and 
you know, in, in hindsight, probably kind of COVID potentially kind of slowed that kind of down as, yeah. the, as the kind of the world and particularly the business needed to focus on, you know, running the business. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, and then the opportunity kind of came up um, and Greg kind of signaled that he was kind of looking to to exit. Mm. And one thing that we, we kind of did was, like I spent a bit of time kind of reflecting on on myself and with Greg kind of going, what what are the areas which I would consider kind of more of a weakness, if you like, yep. and kind of focused on those, because you know your own strengths pretty well, you mm-hmm. know, like I'm good kind of in these areas. Yes. And then through the process of that, that kind of transition, being like really honest and open with the board, mm. particularly going, hey, look, like these, these are the areas that I'm going to need kind of support on or I'm going to need focus or kind of like training or, you know, and and then kind of using those to then go, I've got people like Ash in the team who can foil some of that for me. Yeah. Like, have we got the right team in in position yeah. so spending a bit of time in there um and then you know i think it was important for greg to go through that succession kind of process and, and actually do active handover mm. particularly with like customers and clients yes so, so i got true. up to market pretty quickly well just just before i took the role so in july i was back up in the u.s kind of meeting key customers there so i could introduce myself as incoming CEO awesome. and then I was back up in market kind of quickly after as well so again reconnecting with our key customers then mm. and that was one of my kind of 100 day plan kind of goals was meet our top 10 customers in person awesome um which I'm on track to I'll go to Australia next week to kind of meet, meet some more over there awesome um but yeah that that was an active step was to kind of go right we're going to he's stepping out someone else is coming in and then as a team, Ash, mm-hmm. um, Mike, CFO, Darcy, CRO, we really quickly worked on strategy. Mm-hmm. So we went from um, kind of where we were to re- reforming and realigning a new strategy. Great. Which I think was new, sorry, it was an important step for us to do as mm-hmm. well, because it kind of imprinted like, where are we going to focus on yeah. as a team? Yeah. So we did that really quickly. Putting your first mark on 30 it. 30 days. Mm, yeah that's so cool what about from your perspective ash what has that looked like over the last few couple of years yeah so um a, like a similar kind of journey i think to jono but probably in a smaller time frame yeah like i've been here for almost three years this week now and, and yeah. i think looking back on those three years i think when i originally started it was in an operations manager role and i'd say the first year was really like just learning the job and learning yeah. the business and it takes a bit of time to like find out what the company does and how it works and how to operate and how to like maneuver within it and figure out how to get stuff done which is a a good like first year journey and the second year was probably more of so Mandy um so Mandy and Greg Mm -hmm. um Mandy was the COO um and excellent and Mm -hmm. and really kind of like quite big boots to fill in in a lot of respects both internally and externally yeah Um, for sure I think the second year was her and I really working together and more of that kind of leadership capacity to go okay Ash you've figured out what we do and how to make some product and deliver some stuff to a market Mm -hmm. but like let's use the second year to sort of put your own stamp on stuff and like can you improve and make changes and feel Mm -hmm. confident in leading departments and actually knowing how to contribute at a more like strategic kind of level and so yeah first year learning second year developing and improving and then the last six months as Mandy and Greg were exiting was really what are the tools that you need to Mm -hmm. benefit and contribute to the executive team Mm -hmm. and that's where the Ice House course came in for me is that was really prompted from Mandy and Greg going, we need to round your skill set in some of these other areas of finance and sales and communications and branding yeah. because it's not a lot of experience that I had before. Yeah. Um, and so that's where the Ice House course came in for me is it gave me confidence and a little bit of exposure to these areas in which you've had some exposure to. Mm. But it also gave Mandy and Greg some confidence that I – was developing my own skill set Mm. and, you know, really trying to put my hand up and say yes to a lot of things. Um, And I think that's really important if you're trying to aspire to move 
up in the company ladder or, or gain, you know, mm. s- that, that skill set's really important is that you've got to be pretty well-rounded yeah. because, you know, you become out of, you can move out of doing jobs and where you've got a piece of the puzzle to actually trying to, like, draw the puzzle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, I think you've got to really kind of understand the other functions outside of your, like, core strengths or departments or, like, sort of areas that you understand. So, yeah, yeah so and, cool. and that transition has been really good and I think that... It's kind of given me a good grounding and I know what I can deliver internally, but I also know like what I need to work on and how I can help the rest of the exec team mm. um, sort of succeed as a, as a group together. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think like just like hearing kind of like Ash's story there, I think one, one strong similarity between both of our experiences, like reflected on both Greg and Mandy stepping out, was they both stepped out and gave us the autonomy. Yeah. Yes. to step in concurrently. Mm. And that must be difficult as founders who have been in here for years and have built in. Mm. You know, Amazing team between the two, brand, yeah, right? for sure. Um, and Greg has remained on the board and Mandy um, still kind of observes the board. So they're still there but in governance roles. Yeah. Um, but they've both stepped out and just really kind of let us move yeah. in and, and kind of run it the way that we mm. want to run it. Yeah, that's I brilliant. Think, I think that's also quite, like, I'm a big fan of like growing your own talent mm. like because not only can you kind of mould the person who's coming in to fill your position but you also can help retain the culture of a business as so it true. goes through like transition periods because yeah. I, I like working here because of the people and the feeling and it's like, you know, like there's a good purpose to that whereas it's taken probably two years to really understand and learn those key values so that mm. I can Jono and I can like continue and grow them. Yes. Whereas yeah. I, th- I think I was coming in fresh into a COO kind of level role. I'd probably bring preconceived ideas and try and like implement them and change culture. Yes. But it's actually, you know, you, you do your engagement surveys and stuff here and it's, and we've got mm. a really highly engaged workforce and it's the people and the culture and the feeling and the working with each other that people like. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. And if you can retain that through succession planning, then I think that's probably a good marker of success. Mm, Yeah, that's so, so so cool. Yeah, I think that's a great point, you know, sort of raising up internal rather than going external first is a really great method. And sometimes you need external because you need a skill set or there's significant change and there's there's something you need. But, I mean, there's lots of good talent out there. You've just got to, but, yeah, I'm a fan of growing your own. Mm, Mm. Yeah, that's really awesome. Love that. Um, yeah, want to change gears a bit, but also a very similar note um, to talk a bit about the ISAS program, the leadership development program that you've both been on. Um, cool that Greg and Mandy saw that in you both and went, awesome, we'd love to put you on this ISAS program to sort of help you grow. And, and also you, you mentioned confidence. I think it can be really big on just giving the confidence that you need as a leader. Were there any hesitations for you both before going on the program? What did that look like or were you all in from the get-go? Um, probably well, probably some hesitation around the time commitment, I yeah. think. You know, totally. Because it is, you do kind of commit in, it's like three days, of kind of once a month, kind of yes. three months. Yes, um, But that was kind of quite quickly kind of knocked on the head when you kind of step in through the door and you realise you're with a pretty kind of unique set of kind of individuals who are mm. all there for the same, the same reason. Um, mm. And then it's definitely like as Ash was saying it. What I think what's great about the course is it gives you a really good kind of view across an entire kind of business, mm. like all of the different areas. So finance, sales, um, operations, um, people, HR, law. Yeah. And as you step up, you just become more, much more kind of general. And I think what was kind of good for me was. It was put across, the lens that was kind of put across it was, it's not about kind of like how to operationally run all of those departments. So mm-hmm. it's not about being like a, a sales leader. It's about how do you lead sales. Yeah, And awesome. I think that's, that was like quite strong for me and really, really useful. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, so those initial hesitations around time commitment, it was just, yeah, mm. non, non-starter as soon as I stepped in through the door. Mm, it's quite a common one, like... Mm. Um, for owner manager program and leadership development is like, how am I going to find the time mm. to do this? Um, so it's quite cool hearing, you know, your experience on that too. Anything for you, Ash? Um, no real hesitations. Like yeah. I just heard great things. And awesome. 
like obviously Jono had been through and I think Greg did the owner manager program like yonks and yonks mm-hmm. ago. So like mm-hmm. it came yeah. with a really high rep. So I saw it as just a really good opportunity really. Yeah, that's cool. And like I mean, like Jono said, any time commitment, hesitations, like as soon as you walk in day one and you're out of your like your first three days, you're like, There's so much value I've taken out of three days, like I'm like looking forward to this. Like I have to do it. Like the next course can't come around fast enough because I'm just getting so much out of it. Yeah, brilliant. And like yeah. from a takeaway perspective, I think that just the the people and the caliber that are there sitting around over those days with you is you're just learning as much off the people who are sitting in the room with you than you are off the facilitators. Mm. And I think that like alumni, you know, like you guys call it the ice house magic stuff, mm. is like real <laughs> and like it's yeah, quite yeah. cool. Awesome um, to hear. So yeah, it's just confidence building that most of the people in the room and who do the course are all having the same sort of challenges, even though they come from different industries and different size businesses and there's, but it's kind of all the same problems. Mm. And it's, that's probably my biggest takeaway from the course is that, you know, you gain a whole lot of connections in which you can touch base with and sort of bounce ideas off post the course. Yes. While you're there, you're learning a lot of, you know, new and sometimes not new stuff, but just the confidence that you can, you're not like kind of alone battling your own battle. And yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's been really good. Yeah, that's so cool to hear. Any um, further key takeaways for you, Jono, or would you say that idea of how to lead those teams would be your biggest takeaway? Uh, yeah, I think that was. I think it cool. really was. Uh, yeah. I, and, and so that that's probably like the, the application of leadership. The other part was just I learned a lot about myself mm. through the course. Mm. I think it was like how how you think different to kind of some other people in the room, how you think the same, how you share the same problems, mm. how you tackle problems in different ways. And the profiling was really, really useful, mm. like I said kind of earlier on. Um, so, yeah, so I think I learned it was, mm-hmm. it was very reflective as mm-hmm. well as kind of developmental as well. Did it affect anything for you from a lifestyle perspective? Or did it sort of make you think anything more about balance or work life or anything along those lines? Your, my, my, yeah, my view of like work life balance is you kind of you learn it the hard way. Yeah, <laughs> so know? true. You have to you have to kind of like oscillate between it's out of control to hey, like, I'm, like I can probably kind of push myself a little bit kind of further. Yeah. So um, I think from a from a lifestyle perspective, I learned a lot in the resilience training yeah. in um in the ice house course we had a resilience coach come in on the last i think like on the last day yeah and they was like some of the strongest kind of takeaways that you had where you've got to invest into yourself like into your own personal health Mm. and your own personal mindset and just your mental space if you want to achieve things for like the team and the culture and the business yeah and i've applied loads of things around there so brilliant sleep for example, like a much bigger commitment to sleep mm. um, through that time. So, yeah, they, yep. they were my biggest takeaways. Awesome. That's really cool. Um, what about you, Ash, on that note around I just want to take a moment for sort of resilience as a leader. Um, a lot of changes in the last three months, uh, yeah. three years, yeah, sorry. Nice. Um, what does resilience look like for you during that time? You know, maybe someone's listening to this. They've got young kids. They've got an opportunity to you know, be in that C-suite of a, of a business, what does resilience look like in that daily decision-making? Yeah, like it's like it's really hard. Mm. Um, but in saying that, I think like you've got to have, you've got to have the support at home at the same time. I think that's a real big part. Like, yeah, awesome. Like my wife, Jo, talks about a lot. She's like, like it's like base camp, mm. is that you've got your own like little mountains to climb, but you always come home to base camp and that's where you're like, that's where your food mm. is and that's where your security is and that's where your, like, venting frustration thing is. So I think yeah, that's really that. important is to have your, like, base camp at home where you go home to. Um, and having a, you know, like, God, I don't know what how Joe puts up with me some days and puts <laughs> up with the kids. And, like, it's been a pretty, like, challenging sort of three years of, mm. like, not a lot of sleep. Mm. But you've also got to go, well, I'm in a grindy period now, so you've just got to kind of get on with it. Yeah. Like, Sure, it'd be nice to have eight hours sleep every night and being able to have, you know, leave work at the door when you wander away and Mm. not have any sort of outside of work issues at all. But 
Mm -hmm. You know, when you have young kids and you've got a job and you're like mid to early 30s, Mm -hmm. this is a period of your life where you've kind of got to grind it out and really put in the work so that you've got to, you can hustle through it so (laughs) that, you know, hopefully you don't have to hustle through it in the later stages. So Mm -hmm. like, I think if you've got that perspective of this is a period of time and where it's going to be really grindy and hard and I'm not going to get a lot of sleep and I'm going to be stressed and like, Mm -hmm. but if you're like optimistic through that and knowing that it's going to be a difficult period, yeah, then it's easy to deal with. Um, awesome. And then, yeah, but at the same time, you've also got to recognise when you're tapped out at the same time too. Yeah. And if you don't recognise that and people aren't telling you, mm-hmm. then get people that can tell you. Like mm-hmm. get a bit of base camp. Awesome. <laughs> and yeah. Love One of the best that things part. that Greg said to me when I was coming in, he said, treat it like a marathon, not a sprint. Mm. Where it would be, it'd be easy for both of us, I think, to do twenty six hours of work a day. Mm. You know what I mean? You'd come yeah. Eight days a week. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it totally. Wouldn't, it wouldn't be a problem. <laughs> but that is a sprint. Yeah. And it's just you're never going to be sustainable. So you have to you have to look it over kind of long term. Um, I think the other thing for me has been having a network of people who I can talk to, yeah. and sh- kind of just talk about your challenges. Um, so, you know, mentors, if you like, mm. who, and it's not just one, like kind of have several people and you want to kind of pick on different people at different times to yeah. on the challenges that you have. Yeah. But just sometimes like cathartically, like talking to people about the challenges and just actually getting it yeah. off your weight. Mm-hmm. And I would, I think we're both in the same camp where we've both got really like supportive partners. Yeah, <laughs> and, awesome. You know, Stacey, she has mm-hmm. to bear the brunt of me kind of talking to her <laughs> about some stuff and it's just a pair of ears, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah for okay, sure. Well, good enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really cool. And then like just find the time to... Um, like do do the physical exercise. Mm. Yeah, that's really important. Yeah. Like yeah. I have to do exercise every day. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm the grumpiest person here. <laughs> yeah. I just feel horrible. Yeah, so yeah. Like, and it's to the point of me where I'll sacrifice sleep to do exercise yeah. because it's more important for me. Yeah, you know, wow. You just got to grind it, grind it out and just do it. Because yeah. if you don't do it, then you end up in bad habits and then it just spirals yeah. away. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So relatable. I think there'll be a lot of people listening to this being like, oh, I can relate to that, you know. And so thanks for sharing what that's looked like for you both as leaders. Um, Last question, just to finish this conversation off. I'd love to hear from you both. Who has been influential in your journey that you'd like to thank? You might need to think about it. Well, I've talked a lot about Greg. Like I'd have to give a shout to Greg really because he, you know, he's backed me Mm. through this. Um, and really kind of reflecting on it now, I can probably kind of see the succession planning kind of more kind of in kind of in retrospect. So yes. massive thanks to to Greg there. I, the the board have been really supportive as well. We have um, Pioneer Capital on the mm. board, private equity partner, um, and and Ben and Craig and our chairman John as well have been really really supportive of me kind of stepping up. Awesome. Um, and. You know, kind of coming back to some of the stuff that Ash was talking about, like build, building your talent from the inside. You know, there's, depending on how you look at it, there's potentially like a higher risk kind of approach of going for an unproven CEO, but can bring them from the inside because they understand the business and the culture and the vision. Yeah. Um, versus, hey, let's go for experience on the outside. I think that was that was kind of a brave move on their aspect. Yes. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's very cool. I like that. What about you, Ash? Someone you'd like to thank that's been influential? Yeah, I think, I mean, obviously Mandy and Greg for that transition period has been, like John said, I don't think you realise you're in a succession plan until you're like in a succession plan. Yeah, um, so, so true. It's been like quite, Hold on, what's yeah, going on here? Like, there's lots of lessons there. And like we've spoken about that quite a lot. And it's quite good having them like post transition of them moving out and us moving up to like have that relationship to keep checking in on yes. and like bouncing ideas off. I think that's quite important, like having not exited completely. Then yes, they're still around. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, for sure. Yeah, still so passionate. that's really that's really good. Um, and then so a guy, Jeremy Witten, who I worked with at Fonterra, who was one of my first managers, kind of bosses there, mm. he's really uh, helped me over the last, you know, my entire working career in terms of providing, you know, provided an opportunity or got made redundant out of a role and, mm. and which led to a great opportunity um, 
uh, in the construction kind of sector to learn a new skill. So mm-hmm. that was really good. And he's probably someone that I will touch base with. Cool. Now and again. He's, touch base. he's more in the corporate kind of business side, but as someone who I've had a it's like that guy you check in and every couple of years and yes. if something was to go wrong or if you needed some advice you'd, you'd always say yes he's he's been a really good um sort of connection point for me over the last little while awesome. and then I've, I've got a couple of mates who I went to school with who you know like we're all same age and stage with kids and you know the business owners or they're in the senior exec kind of level as well mm. and We've been best mates since we were like 10. Yeah. And it's cool watching that journey. And it's like, it's really competitive. Like, Mm. it's unreal competitive. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. But in terms of like having that network of really close people that you are really good friends with, but can hear the challenges they're going through, bounce ideas off, talk through stuff, you've got a random idea. Mm. Like, it's actually, you don't realize how much support your friends give you in those things over a course of like a 30 year friendship. Totally. And, you know, probably don't get as much recognition as, say, a more formal mentor or a network that you've got is that, you know, I've really found, you know, Bevan and Sam and, and Cookie have been great for me to just Brilliant. chew the fat over a couple of beers and mm. you talk about the good times and the bad times and it's, yeah, it's, it's more valuable than I think I realise. Mm, that's what it's all about, eh, having those mm. deep relationships yeah. that you can do life with. Yeah, for sure. Oh, that's so cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to finish the combo there, but there's just so much gold out of that and um, I can't wait to share that with our community because, like I said, I think it's a really um, relevant conversation for a lot of business owners and leaders in New Zealand. Um, so thank you both for being on the Ice House podcast, for sharing the story, and uh, you know the Ice House are championing you guys and we're excited to see where it goes. 